Bible history, the Jews for 70 years were taken by the Babylonians out of their own land, taken to Babylon, where they were kept captive. When the Medes came in and defeated the Babylonians under the Medo-Persian Empire, Darius, he allowed the Jews to return home again. When they got home, their land was in ruin. And uh, the first thing they had to do is to begin to rebuild. Zerubbabel, the governor that was appointed by uh, Darius, got back to a land that was hardly habitable. But he realized the first thing he has to do is to rebuild Jerusalem, which was the center, and uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. After the walls of Jerusalem had been rebuilt, some time has gone by, the temple now, they had started, they had laid the foundation to the temple. You can't have a Jewish nation without the temple. And so they began to lay the foundation of the temple. They got the foundation laid, but the neighbors round about them were making fun of them, were teasing them. In fact, the folks around the Jerusalem would say, listen, if we came by and blew on your walls, they'd fall down. And so it discouraged the men who were working, and they quit their work. And so there were the people back in Jerusalem, the walls had been built, they were fashioning their own homes, rebuilding their own houses, cultivating their own fields and land. And God sent a message saying, hey, you've got a pretty nice house. By this time, they had been in the land long enough, they were not only building their houses, but they were putting paneling inside. I mean, they were really making themselves some very nice homes. And so the Lord came by and said, that's a nice house you got. Wish I had. And everybody looked over, and there's the foundation laid, but no walls going up yet on the temple. So Haggai was sent to the people to say to them, get busy building my house. That was their mission, that was their purpose. Here's what God was getting at. The religion of Israel had become so corrupted. The priests who were supposed to make sure that God's things were working properly, were busy taking care of themselves. They were building for themselves nice houses. Their responsibility was to take care of the house of God, and they forgot it. They were instead taking care of themselves. As God's children, our primary responsibility is the honor and glory of God. But sometimes we, too, find ourselves a little busy taking care of number one. Not understanding that we're really not number one. And so Haggai begins to address his people. Jesus asked a question very similar to this when he said, If salt should lose its savor, its ability to be salty, how can you make it salty again? You can't. It's good, Jesus said, for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. If the Jewish priests lost their ability to bring the people to God, then who would do it? As Christian people, when we no longer point toward Jesus Christ, when we're no longer that mirror, when we're no longer that light, what good do we do? The church in recent years has lost a lot of its influence. People used to treat churches with respect. Even the unsaved would walk by your church and knew not to graffiti your wall. Because even the unsaved knew that those were God's wall. But today there are churches that are plastic. Fortunately, the Lord has kept us pretty well safe from that. But you can go to a lot of churches. They're vandalized. It wasn't long ago, somebody came in in the middle of the night, walked off with our organ. You would think, whatever happened to that fear of God thing? When we quit reflecting Jesus Christ, when we quit reflecting God, why should the world fear? If I'm not afraid to offend God, what am I teaching those around me? Not to fear me. And so Haggai begins his preaching and he begins preaching to the priests themselves by asking them this question. What a question he puts to them.
that. Here is somebody who is unclean. And if an un I work in a hospital. I work in a hospital. I'm an engineer for the hospital. On occasions, I have to go up to the floors where the patients are. If I go into a patient's room, I have to wash my hands and sanitize with this alcohol material as I enter the room so that I don't give them anything. And then once I have completed whatever businesses it is, I got to, on exiting the room, I wash my hands and put on some more of that antibacterial stuff. That's why my hands are like leather. Right? But the whole idea is I don't want to give anything to them, nor do I want to take anything out and share it with everybody else. But here's the problem. When you are polluted, when you are diseased, what do you do? If I am... Let's suppose your surgeon all of a sudden come down with some sort of staph infection. How's he going to do surgery? Your doctor comes and let's suppose he has leprosy on his hands or something. He said, let me, let me look at you. you. you got a sore throat. And this guy with his diseased hand starts to put his finger in your mouth. Ain't going to happen. Right? This is what Haggai is dealing with. When they have lost their cleanliness, if you go to polluted water, how do you wash your hands? The water which is supposed to make you clean, all of a sudden is going to make you dirty. You can't use it. There's parasites in it. You can't use it. This is what Haggai is beginning. Look at our first slide. Uh, actually, it's our second slide. It's entitled The Terrible Uncleanness. This is what we get. That's a diseased hand you're looking at. That's the hand that's going to come by and shake yours. That's the hand that's supposed to make you dirty. <coughs> Whatever man touches, he degrades and pollutes. And that's important that you understand. Everything a man touches, he degrades and pollutes. Here's the thought that Jesus was trying to share with us and what uh, Haggai was preaching to his people. If I am a sinful man, how can I help to make you holy? The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Every man that has been born of a woman is a sinner, which is all mankind. If all men are sinful, how can any man help you to become unsinful? How can I hand out to you forgiveness for your sins when I can't even get forgiveness for my own? There's a picture in the Old Testament in this next slide. It was the red heifer. Haggai draws this back in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. The priest would take his hand and lay it on the head of that heifer and confess the sins of the nation. This red heifer then would be taken outside the city and there it would be killed and burned. Every part the skin, the, the blood, the whole thing was burned up into ashes. What did this heifer do wrong? Nothing. Yet he became sin for all the people. And it was astonishing that he was taken outside the gate of Jerusalem to be sacrificed because it's outside. That's why the apostles make a special note to tell you that Jesus Christ was sacrificed outside the city of Jerusalem on Golgotha's hill. The priest would kill the animal. They would then burn the animal. And then the priest would have to go and wash and he was considered unclean all day long until sundown because he had touched this animal. So he was ceremonially unclean. But it was the sacrifice of this animal that reminded the people, the innocent, paying for the guilty. We have this picture given to us and used. 
throughout our New Testament. A red heifer without a spot must be sl uh, slain. Why? When you get to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so we come to this thing. If only blood can wash away man's sin, but all men are sinful, how does God save us then? The blood of the heifer didn't wash away men's sin. It was simply a memorial. They kept those ashes outside the city, and people would look, and they would see that pile of ashes out there, and they would say to themselves, that animal paid for my sins this year. And every year, another animal, and another animal, and another animal, constantly reminding the people that the innocent is paying for my sin. The Bible reminds us, you and I are used to the Passover lamb. And then God puts in his Old Testament, you will continue to sacrifice this lamb until God himself provides the sacrifice. And when you come to Calvary Hill, we find God himself nailed to the cross. Jesus Christ, the virgin-born Son of God, left heaven, took upon himself human flesh. Why? Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. How can God forgive our sins? He has no blood. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we have the incarnation. You and I celebrated this Christmas. When God took on human flesh. Jesus constantly proved that he was God in the flesh. He told everybody, I was God, I am God. They said, prove it. Okay, here, I'll raise a dead guy. Here, I'll, raise, I'll, I'll heal a blind man. He was able to demonstrate and to prove that he was God. He said, I'll give you the greatest test of all. You want proof that I am God, that what I'm saying to you is true? Take my life, and in three days, I'll raise it back up. And so... On Calvary's hill, we took his life, you and me. Our sins nailed him to this cross. And as he bled and died, every ounce of his blood that poured down from that cross washed away my sins. Not by works of righteousness, Titus would say to us, not by works of righteousness, but by the shedding of his blood. I am not going to get to heaven because I'm a good person. Because it's already been stated, there's none righteous, no, not one. All are under sin. The wages of sin is death. Comma. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through what I do, not through where I go, but through Him. Jesus paid it all. Just as that effort paid for the sins of those people for one year, Jesus Christ, sacrificed outside the camp, nailed to an old rugged cross, bled. The only way he could die. You remember in the book of Matthew and in Mark and even in Luke, they tried to push him off a cliff once or twice. If he had died being pushed over a cliff, you and I would not be saved. He had to be sacrificed this way because this is how God said it would be done. There's nothing you can do to buy your freedom. There's nothing you can do. If there was, if there, let's suppose you could be so good that you deserve your way to heaven. And what a waste this is. What a mockery this is. My good next slide. We have the cruelest of cruel gods. If there's any other way, any other way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There is no religion that takes you to heaven. Absolutely not. All religions are fundamentally designed by men, therefore they're fundamentally flawed. This is not a religion. 
this was a man dying for you. Oh, sinner, we need to see our need for cleansing. Because we can't clean ourselves. If it were, remember Jesus Christ when he prayed in the garden the night before he was sacrificed. He said, Father, if there is any other way for men to be saved, then don't make me go through this. And he asked that same question three times. Father, if there is any other way, don't make me go through this. If you could be good enough if you could go to church often enough, if you could give an offering big enough, if you could do anything <coughs> that paid for your own sins, then this is the biggest lie in history. And that's the greatest fool you'll ever meet. The man was absolutely insane. And absolutely a fool. We should be ashamed to even admit we heard it. Or is God and He died to take away your sins? And He was right. I am, He said, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by. I believe that the truth. I believe that by the shedding of his blood. I believe when it says that by his stripes I am healed. I believe that with his shed blood my sins are forgiven. I believe that the way of the cross leads home. I believe it. Because he said it. And he proved it. And you and I know historically, the world does not deny historically Jesus of Nazareth was killed on the cross. They don't like to admit that three days later he came up from the grave. But over 500 witnesses saw it. Over 500. That's more witnesses than have seen most most of the historical things that take place in our life, the things that we take for evidence, more people saw this than more people saw this than saw the Hindenburg go down. Yeah, you wouldn't deny the Hindenburg because you'd say, well, people saw it. More people saw this. It was so significant that we changed our calendar. It comes down to, do you believe him to be the virgin-born son of God? Or do you believe him to be absolutely insane? Those are the two choices you have. Either you can pay your own way, and he's an absolute fool, or you can't, and he's getting for it. And so we come to him and we say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm the sinner for whom you died. Wash away my sins with your blood, and help me to serve you all the days. I try to live a good life, not because I'm trying to get to heaven. He already promised to take me there. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Period. I go, he said in John 14, to prepare a place. Listen, if there wasn't anywhere to go, I'd have told you that. But he said, I go and prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you can be also. Julio took that by faith until 2 a.m. Saturday. All of a sudden, it wasn't faith for him anymore. It was a little faith. And he looked into those eyes that he had only heard. Suddenly, his faith was very, very real. What we do here is take people to the cross. Because only the cross can take that long. In your life, you could ignore God all you want. But in your death, 
my boys and I were talking yesterday about this very thing, and Michael made the point. You will all meet God one day. We will all die. The only thing guaranteed in life is that it will end for everyone. And when you see God, will you see him as a stranger, a God of judgment, or will you see your heavenly Father? There's a big lie going around that God is everybody's Father, but he's not. In fact, Jesus said, you are of your Father, the devil, when he was talking to the priesthood of his day and time. So Jesus didn't say, oh, we're all of the same Father. We all have the same. He didn't say that. Very narrow. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And you don't get to call him Father unless you acknowledge the Son. Period. Again, simple. Uh, what did the thief say there in the temple when Jesus remarked, Lord, be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus said, I got to tell you, that guy went home forgiven. It's not the length of our prayer. It's the desire of our heart. Father, would you forgive me of my sin? I believe this. And so I allowed the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away my sins. I've accepted that as an act that God has performed for me. And now, when I die, I'll look into the face of Jesus Christ too. Not that I'm any better than anybody else. Not that Julio was a perfect man. Most of you who knew him knew he was a, he was a good guy. But would you go so far as to say he was one perfect fellow? I don't think so. And here's the problem. Only perfect people can get to heaven. That's why Jesus is the only one that ever got there on Sunday. The rest of us all need his help. Julio understood that he asked Jesus to save him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we say this now, we're not trying to scare anybody, <clears throat> but the truth is, you don't know when you're like the way. People come to the law, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. For some folks, tomorrow will come. Today is the appointed day, the Bible says. Today, if you should hear the Holy Spirit speak into your heart, don't turn it away. Say, well, I didn't grow up. Listen, I, the first time I ever heard the good news of Jesus Christ, I didn't grow up that way either. I grew up in a completely different religion, and let me tell you that Jesus Christ died for my sins, and I could go to heaven brand new to me. But there it was, black and white in the Bible. What am I to do with it? Do I call the Bible a lie? Or do I say, that's God's word, I'm going to do what God said. If God said it, I believe it. I believe the word of God. And I would rather trust God's word than any man. I don't care how old nice he dresses. I ain't believing him. No, not the word. And so if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord, the question you want to ask yourself is this, a very simple one. It's the same one that I asked Julio years ago. If you die today, you know for sure you go to heaven. But would you die? The Bible says these things are written that you might know to have eternal life. And that this life is in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you don't know that, then give me a moment of your time.